and welcome to University Museums at Colgate's Artist Perspective Series, an ongoing podcast featuring Colgate students speaking with artists whose works are represented in the University Museum's collections. Generous support for this podcast has been provided by Art Bridges. Learn more about their incredible work at artbridgesfoundation.org. My name is Nick West, curator of Picker Art Gallery. Our first set of conversations are with artists who have works in the exhibition Exit, Prints for the 21st Century, which is on view at Picker Art Gallery until December 19th, 2021. During its 30 years of operation, Manhattan-based alternative art space Exit Art was a place for underrepresented and outsider artists, including many minority, LGBTQ, and women artists, to come together, create, exhibit, perform, and ultimately to advance the story of what constitutes art and who can make it. Picker's collection of Exit Art prints, drawn from benefit portfolios donated to the museum by Exit Art after its closure in 2012, address many contemporary issues surrounding race, inequity, and identity. The variety of images and themes, identities and techniques, perfectly captures the spirit of collaboration, experimentation, and inclusion that Exit Art was founded upon. In this interview, student curatorial assistant Emily Karavich, a 2021 graduate with a dual bachelor's in history and German, asked Diana Al-Hadid about her artistic process and how Exit Art impacted her development as an artist when creating We Will Control the Vertical from the Exit Art portfolio America America, printed in 2009. Al-Hadid explores structural depth in her work, building sculptural paintings up layer by layer over a long period of time. The artist is interested in the architectural components of artwork and society, inspired by her current environment in Brooklyn, New York. Her work has been shown internationally, and her print, We Will Control the Vertical, is currently on view at Colgate University's Picker Art Gallery in the exhibition Exit, Prints for the 21st Century. Please tell us about a little bit about your relationship with Exit Art and like the project that Exit Art was. Uh, so like, what did the organization mean to you and how has it impacted your own development as an artist? I was asked to do this very early in my career. Actually, I don't really remember the date on the print, but I knew about Exit Art by reputation because it was this really cool alternative, like nonprofit, huge space that uh, eventually closed, unfortunately. So, and I knew that they did these portfolios where they would ask a handful of artists to create a new print. And I was fortunate to be in this portfolio with, with some other super cool artists and I got to keep some of their work too. Anyway, yeah, it was pretty early on. And to be honest, my relationship with them was really just this print. I didn't do a show in their space. And, but I remember it was, I believe it was her Tam that invited me. If I'm him, I remember that's how we met. He was with Exit Art. I've, I've had more, more of a life because this print has really gotten, gotten around. So I've had more of a relationship with Exit Art by way of the, this print traveling to so many different institutions than actually the physical space. So it's, it's living on through these print portfolios more than anything. But yeah, that's my relationship with, with the space. I, I think it was maybe one of my, Maybe it was the first print I did outside of school. I guess that's kind of like a perfect lead into the next question, which is, did you have any prior experience with printmaking before you had to make the print for Exit Art? Yeah, I'm not, I don't think I'm, uh, it's interesting because I, a lot of people after seeing my drawings and realizing I work on mylar a lot and I work so much with layers have, have suggested that printmaking would be a natural medium for me. But the thing that I think they've never, or maybe that that's been difficult for me is that I have a conflicted relationship a little bit with multiples. And so I'm always interjecting at each step along the way in a process. So even though I do work in layers, I, I'm always kind of stepping in to affect each, each layer, each, each part of the process. I, I kind of feel like I need to manipulate. I, I do understand why it would 
white, white people have always thought it would appeal to me, but I've made surprisingly few prints in my life. I think I would like to make more, but I think I've realized that I'm a slow learner. So I need to really, really spend a lot of time with it to understand how I can kind of interject in the process in a way that's satisfying and meaningful and still still make it make sense that the work is multiplied. I made another print last year. It's a similar thing where an organization invites you to kind of make, make a print with them to maybe auction or support the organization. It was a totally different, it was black and white. It's very different from the one that you have. But but yeah, I still don't feel like I totally get it, even still. I mean, I get it, I get it, but I don't, but I don't have I don't feel like I have full command yet. I still feel like there's so much for me to learn in printmaking. I risk I do more monotypes because usually again when it comes out, I'm like, oh, I want to uh, adjust this little thing or fix little little part there. And I don't know. I'm I'm always I am still always working on my work. If it's anywhere near me, it's it's at risk of changing. So yeah, I actually was just working on a sculpture that I thought was done. I'd photographed it and put it, you know, show, ex- exhibited it. And then now it's back and I just changed half of it pretty radically. So this is the risk of the work <laughs> staying, staying in proximity to me. But yeah, I think, I think I would like to make more prints. I just really need to dive in a lot deeper. Like I need to basically do it so much more regularly in order for me to really feel like really gained command of the materials because this is it's just how I it's how I do all of my work and so it's hard when you're printmaking because you're relying on you know the, the schedule and the, the help of other people and but but I do really I do really get into the science and the chemistry of how prints are made I got into this thing when I was an undergrad called waterless lithography which I've Real, no one has only like two people have ever heard of it. It was invented by like this random guy, and um, it's extremely toxic. And I don't think you're supposed to, I don't think it's a good idea to work with it. But when I was younger, I didn't really I didn't think about that stuff, I guess. It was fun because it you could kind of draw using Xerox transfer and using like oil sticks. It was basically there was a list of materials that worked that you could draw with and a list of materials that kind of wouldn't work. And I think they were all sort of oil-based because I think there was a silicone that protected it. And then the, and then you rub acetone over the whole plate and it removes, uh, I don't remember, it's been so long, it's over 20 years, but um, I remember really thinking the process was so interesting because you could get so many different textures and marks and really draw right on the plate. And I did a lot of that in undergrad. I did, I actually also did a lot of photography in undergrad. I tried a lot of things, but I, you know, it takes, it takes a long time for me to understand the material where it's just extremely intuitive because you really need to work with the whole range of processes and materials are so much in printmaking, right? There's so many different ways to make a print. There's so many, and with digital processes, you know, so it was, it's a little intense when you first come to it and you don't really know what kind of thing you want to do. You want to make a silk screen? Do you want to make an etching? Do you want to make a, you know, do you start on the computer? Or do you start like how there's uh, what kind of paper? There's so many variables. It's mind numbing, but it's interesting, you know, to see early work as well. When you don't have that kind of intuitive flow worked out. I think this print looks very different from a lot of my work, although now my work actually might look a little more like it's a little more bright, but this is almost like a the colors are very, they're almost fluorescent. They're very bright. I'm trying to remember it. I don't want to open my computer, but it's very like blue and pink and green. I guess I do use those a lot, but they're just, they're just so much brighter, almost like a neon. I think my work now is most of my work's a little dirtier. There's a little bit of, there's a little more grit, I guess. But yeah, I was saying about early work. I think it's really, I think it's a really interesting window into an artist's work. Look at their early work. My husband and I talk about this a lot when we discover someone's early work and it 
kind of give some important insight into, you know, the, the things that would eventually stick or that would, uh, you know, hold, hold tight in an artist practice over the years. And, you know, you kind of try to like take out the parts that are more of an anomaly in the work and, and see what's consistent or where the, the seeds of the certain thinking were first planted. It's, as I look back on that, I, I can see some of those, some of those things early on that are still with me. And some things that I feel like I was there, I was coming into fresh. And so I, and I did do things that maybe were maybe less characteristic of my work now. And I think that was in the color palette mostly. I think it was, you know, cause I could only work with four colors, I guess, or five, five colors. I'm not a colorist. I'm more of a sculptor. So I, I'm not, I always feel like I, I'm still learning about painting and color. And, and so that was hard to kind of accept that I could only have four, four colors and that I could only, they could only, they could only change, it would only multiply as they were layered on top of each other. Yeah, that just didn't, that, that was a little frustrating. But, you know, limitations are good too. Talking more about early work and how you've translated your background mm -hmm. as a sculptor into 2D printmaking. The title of the work is We Will Control the Vertical, which mm -hmm. when I first read that, I made connections between your sculptures and the print itself because it reminded me of those the sculptures where you kind of like paint it and then would peel the paint off and just like hang them around the, the gallery space. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was kind of like echoing a lot of maybe your future work at the time. So I wanted to kind of ask about how did your background in sculpture like affect your approach to printmaking as a whole, like change the way that you would see printmaking and does it make it difficult for you at some times? Yeah, I mean, I think it was difficult for all of the reasons that are inherent to printmaking, which is that th things are kind of stay flat and that you don't kind of see the results until it comes off the press and it's less immediate. There's more mediated steps before you kind of see the thing in the end. Yeah. And, and because, I mean, I do a lot of flat where I do a lot of drawings, I do a lot of panels, but they do tend to come from, I think they're rooted in materials that I, you know, that I learned from sculpture and they're, they're really more about the material and, and the space and they are about, you know, trying to kind of articulate a specific image that I've, I have preconceived or something. So I'm not really a pictorial thinker. I'm more of like a spatial thinker, if there's if there are such divisions. Um, but yeah, the title actually it did speak to me. I remember I think I was watching I was watching a science fiction show at the time called The Outer Limits, and they had this the introduction was this sort of like distorted, haunting, you know, it's like, like we will control the vertical, we will control it was this. I don't remember it now, but you can look it up. It's there's something kind of creepy about it, and I I I thought I was like, well, I do try to control the vertical too. Like I feel like that that it just stood out to me because there's there's so much that you can read that the human mind understands immediately when you see vertical forms. You know, you relate it to standing erect figures. You relate it to buildings. It's everything that that the landscape is not in a way landscapes are horizontal and verticality is like they're like tree forms right or like maybe mountains so at the time I was building a lot of like towers and structures and they were all using metal rods and you know welding welding lines together as so a sort of like drawing in space I feel like my my approach to most mediums is to like to use the organizing principles of a different medium and apply it to the one I'm working with. So I feel like when I'm making sculpture, I'm almost relying on drawing logic in some ways. Like I'm using a lot of marks to build up a form. And when I'm using, when I'm on a flat work, 
withdrawing. I'm kind of almost stabbing the thing and trying to excavate behind layers. And like, you know, there's, and when I make my panels, it's almost, it's, so there's, there's a lot of like confused or jumbled logic, I guess. But yeah, the, this, this idea of controlling verticality and this idea of controlling really the power of gravity, right? Or trying to have control over gravity is a very baseline sculptural instinct to try to kind of keep things either vertical or, you know, to kind of think about how they connect to the ground and how they meet the ground. So verticality is like a, the, one of the, just the core, one of the core considerations, I guess, when you're making an object in space. And I think almost all my work is a matter of flipping between vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, building up planes and drips. And so it is, it's very sculptural, but it's also not the kinds of colors. And I think I flipped it, didn't I? Do the drips go up? I think the drips fly upward. Yeah. Yeah. So I first made the kind of downward drip. And then I rotated it and drew it so that they were going going in reverse. I still do that. I, I flip things upside down a lot every so often. I'll just make something either at the start, I'm flipping the image upside down, or I do it at the end, or a sculpture. I think like a building strategy I feel like I've used before in an older work. But yeah, I've been flipping things upside down for a long time, I guess. I made an upside down cathedral. I think maybe that's when it started like when I was very young yeah so there are a lot of little clues in that piece aren't there I guess so (laughs) (laughs) yeah I can't escape yourself no we really can't sometimes so do you find yourself often using like 3d methods with your 2d methods like 2d practices and then 2d practices with 3d methods you had talked about it briefly but I wanted to see if you find that the changeability kind of important to how you work I think it's maybe it's like maybe it's like my contrarian brain getting in the way of what I what I'm doing where I'm like I'm gonna make a sculpture and my brain's like no you're gonna look at paintings instead while you make the sculpture like I don't know I don't know why why exactly that is but I and it's not so conscious it's more like this thing that I that I've kind of noticed later where drawings are flat but they're built up they're built up so much and they're so textural and my kind of the one thing that I have a hard time with prints is well and it's not that big a deal I could probably do it but I've always wanted to work on, on a transparent or semi-transparent surface I've never really wanted to work on a, on just like an opaque sheet of paper and I don't draw on like regular white paper I always draw on mylar so even that and, and the basic premise of my drawings are that there's that that you can see through it that the substrate is semi transparent that there's space behind the drawing has always been sort of a, just a key key thing i feel like it overcommits to just put this white base and even my panels like i you know they're also you can kind of see through them and i think that that's a consistent instinct in my work in the sculptures and the panels and the drawings it's not maybe so obvious but I've just in the the prints are the only times where they're printed on a regular paper and my fight is to make that paper dissolve or to make it make you forget about it yeah to undermine it I guess so you can imagine that there's space behind it I got to work on that some more though. You've got, that could be a better territory for me. That part's always been a little hard, just like drawing on, on paper that's not transparent. So yeah, that's sort of another way that I think sculpture rules over my drawings is to have, you know, the paper be mylar. I feel like that's coming from a sculpture, sculptural place. Yeah, so that's why I'm like, I've only done, I mean, I don't think I've done 10 prints in my life. I don't think, I mean, maybe. Maybe if you include monotypes, but as a series, I don't, 
I don't think I've made that many. So I still, I feel like I have yet to like put in my 10,000 hours or whatever it is on printmaking. And I guess that's why they each look really different. Like I think they pretty radically different. I haven't thought about it too much, but you know, I just, it, it, I really need to just bring a press into the studio. I have a hard time working outside of this, like going to a place. The only time that that makes any sense is for foundry work. And even then I bring the pieces back to the studio and I keep working on them in the studio. Um, so probably if I had like a printing press or something, I would, I would go a lot further. I mean, that seems obvious, but it's, it's a pretty serious barrier for me. Like I need to, I need to be totally immersed in it, in a thing to, to even remotely start to understand it. It's so ironic. I keep telling everyone, like I've made this huge discovery. I'm like, I'm a slow learner, guys. I'm a slow learner. Like I'm so excited to have discovered, you know, I'm pushing 40 and it's, it's just like, it, it's perfectly appropriate that I later in life have realized that I'm a slow learner. <laughs> of course, that's not something you know when you're young, but like, you know, meaning that I, I let things really simmer for a long time. Like I have to get to the root, the, the, the kind of the DNA, the like chemistry of the thing to really understand how I can manipulate it and make as many experiments as I can before I can kind of weed out what works and what doesn't and what's going to have like a lot of growth potential, right? Because some things, you know, maybe it doesn't work so well, but a part of it don't, sort of works well. And then you can like transfer that and start, start, another, start another work based on what you discovered you know, on the periphery of an experimentation from that failed before. Yeah, so I guess you talked a little bit about what challenges you face when you're producing art or making art. What would you say is like the most challenging aspect for you when producing any sort of art, whether it be from printmaking? Just, just having time, just having the time. It's <sighs> literally the only barrier. I feel like it's literally the only barrier in my life, I think. I don't know. I mean... And knowing, knowing it very well, I think that is the only, that's the only thing in my way is I have space, but I just don't have the kind of time that I used to. I do a lot of other things that aren't making stuff that I committed myself to. I probably need to roll back on, but that's the biggest barrier if we're talking barriers. I don't think there's a lot, like the psycho, any psychological barriers are probably not, they're probably not significant enough to report back home about they're probably pretty par for the course. You know, I don't have, because I rely so much on my materials and process and, you know, just playing with my hands. I don't have a lot of writer's block per se in that I don't have to like wait for a, a big idea before I can start on something. I kind of, I sort of baby step into everything. I, I kind of just start, I just mess around a little bit. And, and, you know, the work will evolve maybe at a glacial pace over many years, but it's still evolving. And then you can look back and you can say, oh, okay, that caught my attention that year. That caught my attention that year. And I, my work drifted in this way for a while. I wonder why, you know, so I try not to kind of predetermine too much when I start something. So the, the, there are barriers. Like I have a hard time with titles sometimes. And I, I do a lot of like sort of... A, almost like being like a spectator on the sidelines with my work where I kind of try to just do something and then not put too much, not, not put too much on it to start and then sort of step back and reflect, you know, cause it's all a weird psychological process in the end anyway. And it's all like, I, I try not to like, I try not to psych myself out too much and like put too much weight on each individual thing because you just never get anything done that way. And I, you know, I'm mostly making all of this in response to a certain like temperament or anxiety or like emotional state or enthusiasm or something like some things at work that gets it going. And then I just, just trust that and, and, and move on. And along the way, I sort of understand more what I'm doing as I'm kind of you know, standing at the sidelines and looking in saying like, oh, that's weird. I've been, I've been doing this thing, you know, I think it's also interesting to notice the decisions that you're choosing not to make on a thing. Like I let things sit in the studio for maybe like way too long. I've a sculpture in here. It's been here for like three and a half years, I think. Um, it's been at least, at least two years. And sometimes it makes big, I make big moves on it. And then it just sits there for a long time. And just recently I was like, oh, I know what I was holding this kind of area for. And I realized it would make a perfect, it like perfectly um, supports an idea that I just started 
with now, but the piece started three years ago, if that makes sense. But like, there's a part of it that I've kind of refused to resolve um, only to realize very recently that that part, again, would like perfectly support an, a new idea. Yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird process, but that's just time. That's my biggest barrier. I wish I just had more time, but you know, I'll get a babysitter again one day once I was vaccinated. I guess that also leads into what I wanted to ask, which is always the dread question during this past year of how has COVID really like affected the way that you can approach art or like how much time you have to really spend doing art during such a hectic time and even 2020. Yeah. There are like direct, maybe there are t- effects or maybe more tangible um, shifts in the work. Like my work definitely got more colorful. It definitely got more more established in landscape. I've been I've been recently like I think a lot of people getting like a growing obsession with plants. But that also kind of started before COVID because I did, I started doing more like public outdoor p- projects. And so my thinking was oriented more specifically around the outdoors and what is, how my work kind of sits in a natural landscape and what plantings can do and how I can, do I, how I can and if I want to control the landscape and so that those questions all started coming up. It's like a whole new, it's a whole new material science. I have, I've really, I've gotten really curious about soil science in the past year. I've like started, I set up a big composting system. I bought a place upstate. And so um, COVID kind of, we because we spent more time upstate. Now I'm learning about nature, which I've never learned about. And sl- like some things about cooking a little bit, but still not very good at that but you know I'm just like learning about how plants grow I mean I've just never really taken much time with it I mean you know these things right like because we're like live on this planet you know what plants grow and they're green at least you know that they need water they need sun but it's so interesting to learn about the different chemistries different soil properties so again like I'm starting at this really root pun intended source right where to understand the material, you have to start at the very base, you know, so I, I'm just learning. I'm like super into composting and, like, and planting. I planted like, I don't know, I've planted maybe 50 to 60 plants so far and trees and shrubs and flowers. And and I bought, I think that when I say I get obsessed about something, like I don't understand moderation ever. Like I got really into house plants and I think I bought like over 150 house plants in two months. Like I just sort of, you know, that's what COVID did to me. It got me, it got me to like supercharge an interest that was just budding. But, um, but because I was spending time upstate and I was in a totally different environment, now other things are, you know, that they just start to respond to that, right? When I was living in New York and I mean, I'm still living in New York, but when I was only in New York and my materials, you know, they're all coming from build they're building materials and like old cardboard and it's old, you know, deal and it's polystyrene and it's wood scraps and it, you know, like all these like city, city things. <laughs> they're city materials. And now I'm upstate and I don't know. So that's not a very tangible result yet. But I just I know that I'm again pun intended, digging into a different different territory now like I'm just I like need to know everything I can about plants before I can make the most simple shift in my in my in my work in that direction so I guess to kind of wrap things up a little bit is there anything that you want to discuss about your artistic process that you maybe didn't mention as a whole or I think you covered everything (laughs) I feel like I did. I don't know. Um, unless you can think of something specific. I'm, I'm an open book. I don't think there's anything. It was really nice to hear about your artistic process and how you approach these things because I like to dab a little bit in art myself. So it's really nice to hear from <laughs> another artist. Oh, that's awesome. Anyway, thank you guys so much. And I really appreciate accommodating my complex scheduling
for listening to Artist Perspectives. We appreciate you joining us. A reminder that the exhibition Exit, Prints for the 21st Century, is on view at Picker Art Gallery until December 19th, 2021. Thank you to Art Bridges for the generous support to make this podcast possible. To the students and artists featured, to Karen Wolf for producing, directing, and editing these segments, and to Ellie Miller, Class of 2022, for her production assistance. Thank you also to Colgate University, President Brian Casey, and the Colgate Board of Trustees. I'm Picker Art Gallery curator Nick West. Until next time.